God is good all the time. May that be a revelation in our life. A revelation that will change the game. I'm excited. God is doing so much. And the truth is he's always been doing so much. And I th- almost think it's just like when you serve the Lord, you just can't help but say that because God is just doing so much. But the question is how much are we willing to be a part of? Because he's always doing something. Always doing something. And his heart is for his, his family to always be a part of. You know. And so there's a lot going on. Um, I want to update you on some information on what's been going on with Saturate USA, or I'm sorry, Saturate Toledo. I had an opportunity to meet with some leaders at Friendship Baptist Church this past week uh, on Thursday. And we just had a great time uh, getting to know one another, getting to learn one another. Oh, here's a picture. This is, obviously you see me there in the corner. The heart of the leaders up there, honestly, to to be straight up honest with you, is we are just representing the body of Christ. You are there. Thanks, Todd. (laughs) Todd's excited he's there. You are there. I mean, there are so many members of the body of Christ there. And we are just getting together as representation for the body of Christ. And so I just wanted to show you, this was our meeting. This this was at the end of the meeting. You can go ahead and take uh, the next picture. This was us kind of really getting into figuring out what's going on with Saturate. How are we going to uh, divvy up the 43615 area code and the 17? So we have five churches involved, uh, four including us. Gateway Baptist, which is right off Door Street, uh, and and McCord, literally like in our backyard. Um, You got uh, Westgate Chapel uh, represented there. You've got uh, Friendship Baptist right there, uh, 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 there, and you also have uh, New Directions. And so you have five churches total, and we're trying to figure out, Lord, how do you want us to cover 20-some thousand households? And we all realize this, is, this, is, this has nothing to do with church territory as, as local assembly. Amen. Nothing to do with it whatsoever. That our heart is strictly for every home to be impacted with a gift where they have the opportunity to open. But not just that, our hearts there were for all of us to be involved and to have an encounter with the obedience of the Father when it comes to interacting with people. Like I said, this is just a tool. And it's a great one. Because it's getting us out of our zone. I'm going to show you a little bit what what I think, how God operates when he's trying to get us to do something and to be obedient. Okay, And so these are the churches that are involved. Like I said, we had a great meeting. You can go to the next picture. These represent the the churches and the numbers of households that are responsible for. So New Directions has taken on 6,000. They're on the opposite end of the 1-5. They're kind of near uh, the the 1-5 where the 1-4 starts. So they're also helping in the 1-4, but they're also helping in the 1-5. Okay, so they've taken on 6,000 there. Friendship Baptist has taken on 5,842. West Side Community and Gateway have decided to partner together because we are so close together. And so they, they have about maybe 50 members in their local assembly. And so I just said, man, how can we help? You know, and, and uh, Pastor Tommy Briggs, he was absolutely excited to hear that that we just weren't going to leave them all by themselves because he didn't know what was going to happen. And so now we have, between us two, we're going to cover uh, 5,600 homes just about. And then Westgate Chapel will cover 5,627 for a total of uh, 23,142 households that we have committed to. You know, and, and, and it's great. It's great. God is doing something and he's trying to get his church to move. This is just the tip. This is just the beginning of the churches coming together and realizing there is something bigger than me. It's him as the head. What's that? 
Amen. Amen. That, that, no, Randy's absolutely right. That, that was one of the biggest, tr the biggest trials is getting the churches together. And then when we come in, we disagree. Hey, we're laying everything down at the feet of Jesus, and we're going to try and figure out his kingdom on this earth the best way that he enables us by his spirit. And so we believe, I mean, even in prayer, it was Holy Spirit led. We just, really, Holy Spirit, have your way. And so we just started strategically discussing how we're going to do this. And so this is what it's going to look like. But every leadership knows that we're going back to our local assembly saying, we need you. You know, it's great in the harvest part. We have a lot of sign-up sheets. But I mean, other than that, the volunteer, the dedication to serve, uh, just to be real, it is, it is pretty low. I'm not going to lie to you. I know, you know, I love you all, and Sunday's great, but God has got more for us than Sunday because we are family. We are family, and if we can't be real with one another, it is time to rise up and rearrange our schedules for the kingdom of God and to move forward. I understand we all have families. We all have priorities, but God is saying 633 in Matthew to rearrange our priorities and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added. I'm not saying our houses are out of order. I'm just trying to re-encourage us that we are a body of Christ, saying we are going to do this in the city together. And so we're looking at, we're looking, I got to contact Friendship Baptist because they're the hub. This week they're getting all the materials. And so we're looking to have like a packaging party, a fellowship time to get the saints to know one another, to say, hey, we're down the street from one another. How can I pray for my brother? Whatever that looks like, Holy Spirit, have your way. And we're going to package these things. This is just a tool. This is a tool. And so I am excited, I hope you are, that we can figure out our schedules, get before the Lord and say, how can I? Maybe you can't walk in the neighborhood, but man, if you can pack, we're going to need you there. We'll go back in the day where they, we sign you up. Sign you up like they signed up my dad. Congratulations. But there should be an excitement when it comes to serving with the body. And so seek the Lord. I mean, we're going to have sign-up sheets, but I mean, really, I mean, Lord, have your way. Have your way, Lord, with us. And so we're looking to get with at least, at least Gateway and us if we can't schedule it, but it could be at Friendship Baptist with three churches getting together saying, hey, let's get this thing going. How do we, how do, we do this together? And so that's the first major thing. But the second after that is, you can go to the next slide. This is what the 1-5 looks like. If the highlighted numbers are the number of households in that mail carrier route. Okay? So this is my fancy writing here, uh, some of it. So you can see down below, you have new directions down there. They're taking on some of that with another church, ho hopefully. Um, and then Friendship Baptist there. They're willing to cover all that, Westgate Chapel up there. And so we've divvied up that map to where we're covering over 20,000 households. Amen. Amen. Thank you for doing that. So I just wanted to catch you up to speed, but the 9th is a projected date, and it's a Saturday. I know it's a Saturday, and I know it's busy. Busy. Whoa. But man, I tell you what, if, if you could just rearrange that schedule to do something like this and get together, that would be absolutely amazing. That's for packaging. And then the 16th and a tentative date, whether depending on the 23rd and maybe the weekends, we're not sure, Saturday and Sunday, we're going to get together with Gateway at either here or there, and we're going to strategize as a church to go out and start being sent out in these neighborhoods. We're going to pray it up. We're going to weigh it up. We're going to his way it up. That's all we're going to do. We're going to let him do his thing. But we need young families. We need middle-aged families. We need older families. We need everybody to come together. Can I get an amen? amen. Everyone who said amen, that's what I'm talking about. The goal is this. We've been talking about reconciliation. We've been talking about this, and we've been talking about hope. We have to get a serious, uh, we have to be serious about our business when it comes to understanding 
that people are in captivity. That people are in absolute darkness. Captivity speaks of being imprisoned. Caged up, locked up, can't get out, stuck. Too bad, so sad, sayonara. I mean, that's the mentality and attitude they don't even know that they carry, but they're walking in it. And we see it. We know. Listen, since the world began, captivity has been an issue. And we've talked about it in the past. Paul says simply to take our thoughts into captivity because we know the danger of letting those things run wild. Man, they'll eat our lunch. They will eat our lunch. They've eaten my lunch. They've eaten my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I mean, it had everything. So the importance of the imprisonment is that we have to take those things captive, but if not, they take us captive. And here's what the Lord showed me about being, being in captive or captivity. One of the biblical things is, when it talks about captivity, is one being taken by force like with a spear. And I thought, wow, that sounds just like the enemy wanting to penetrate our minds and penetrate our lives and to just get his way in to proclaim his ground in our lives. Another thought about captivity is this. It's a, it's a related word, and it'll change the whole game it did for me because I don't think of captivating as something wrong. Being in captivity, I have a sense of, man, there's something going on in my life that needs to be unlocked and let go because Jesus wants to continue to use me to the best of his ability in my life. But the enemy is so slick because he'll take captivating and use it against us. Where we become mesmerized, almost like a spell. Mesmerized. So many things are captivating. So many things are shiny. Everything that shines is not gold. I took a piece of jewelry to the jewelry shop one day. Man, was I embarrassed a long time ago offended what do you mean five bucks for that it ain't re that's real that is a real chain no it ain't <laughs> boy i got i was disappointed and upset <laughs> but think about it with those words captivated captive captivity eve was captivated Adam was shortly after taken captive. And now humanity walks in captivity. That simple. And the dangerous thing about being captivated, on the other end of that, if you look at Israel, who was freed from captivity. They were freed from captivity. But when things don't go their way, there they are. I think it's in Exodus chapter 13 or 14 or 15 where they're faced with a decision. The enemy is behind them and nowhere to go in front. And they're on their way. They're on the way to being released. They're on their way to the promised land. I should probably tie my shoes next time. And they say, Moses, why have you brought us here to die in Egypt? We're better off back. They were mesmerized. They were spent.
bound by their past captivity. A couple chapters later, they're hungry. Moses, why have you brought us out here to die? We're starving to death, Moses. We had meat. We had regular meals. We had, we had the usual. We had the comfort in our captivity. It's amazing when times get tough how we get captivated to going back in the other direction. We have to understand the importance that God has given us the keys of the kingdom to unlock the minds and hearts of those who don't know him, but we have to live in that as well. The keys of the kingdom of God will unlock the dungeon to any soul. It'll always be a battle. That's good news. I know it may not sound like it, but it'll always be a battle. The Bible says that our flesh is contrary to the spirit and our spirit is contrary to the flesh. We have to be prepared and ready to understand that so we don't go back and get captivated from the place where we were. Because remember, we're talking about the gift and ministry of reconciliation. Are we okay out there? Why is reconciliation so important? Let me ask you this. If you have done something before, if you have been through something, if you have been walked through something, is it safe to say that everyone who has been through that process knows what it's like for the next person to go through that process? Is that just safe to say? I showed you how to do something. Or you had a revelation how to do something. And I say, how was that done? Should you not know how to show me? Is that a trick question? You should, right? I mean, if I, if, if I know how to do a math lesson, because I've learned it, and I get it, should I not know how to apply that same math lesson to somebody else so they get it? I mean, that's just a simple process of understanding reconciliation, because God has given us that gift that he has reconciled us to himself through Jesus. And now he, we have been committed with the same ministry. Reconciling man to God as a vessel and nothing more and nothing less. And we have to understand hostility. We have to, that, that's basically what, that's basically what, is going on here when it comes to reconciling. Reconciling just speaks of nothing more than an exchange. And this this is just how good our God is. Because no way in my mind and in my life will I give you something that's great for something that's garbage. It's not fair. Why would I give you something that's so good when you want to hand me something that's so yucky and nasty and filthy? But that's what God does with reconciliation. We have to understand that the hostility is not God at us. He despises the sin that is in the world But at his creation, it's not at us. It's our hostility towards him. 
It's humanity's hostility that God wants to exchange his friendship for. Because friends to him, the, the meaning of friendship today is fading. And surface at best with Facebook. Because you're on top of the world when you have 10,000 friends. And can barely look people in the eye and speak to them face to face. Because in reality, you have no friends. That's a struggle. That's a real thing out there. Friendship to God is absolutely amazing. It speaks of being dear to. It speaks of being loved. That's why we know that there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. I believe there are, there are two main issues why we struggle with reconciling as a ministry. One, it's because we can't get past that if God has reconciled us to himself, not counting our sins against him, we count other sins against us and him, and they don't even know the Lord. As Christians, we cannot characterize people by what they do or what they say unbelievers are lost we should be we should not be shocked or surprised by anything we hear from someone who doesn't live for jesus but we are we're shocked we're surprised how can this be put 10 people in a dark room for hours and you'll see and hear hostility come about And then we judge. I'm not saying us. I'm talking about the church in general. We judge. God has not called us to be avengers. He's called us to be ambassadors. But we want to avenge for God. We want to say, they're, they're, we want to talk about their issues. Like, like, why are they so imperfect? Did you forget the gift you received? I'm not trying to preach at you. I'm just, I'm going. We, we were once there. And all of a sudden, we're not there. We're like, what are you doing? Like, we're shocked. Our hearts should be broken. When I talk to people who are the Lord, nothing surprises me. I go in with no surprises. But with every expectation of what they tell me is normal because they don't know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then we, the church, have a level of darkness like shades. What, what shade is your darkness, gray? What is yours? It's like, it's like charcoal. Woo, it's getting darker. It's getting heavier. Man, dark is dark. Light is light. Let's make it simple. This will also give us a, a real revelation when the Bible talks about loving your enemy. Because we think, at least I have in the past, my enemy is someone who I don't like, who, who, who is opposite of, of myself or my thoughts? Your enemy are not those people. Blessed are us because we are persecuted, for they hated him first. It's a spiritual battle. Spiritual battle. A revelation of loving your enemy. The revelation that Stephen had when he was stoned. 
seeing Jesus like he's never seen him before, seeing the, the glory of God and, and able to say only by the Spirit of God inside of them, forgive them? Absolutely. I, I believe God's heart has always been for his people. And it didn't start with you and I. Didn't start with the Jews. Didn't start with Abraham. It started with his creation. His heart is for humanity. Jew and Gentile was only for a season, but it was never meant to be. Amen? Quiet in here. And I believe his heart has always been to have a land for his people flowing with milk and honey. His desire, not that a land be of Cain and permanent, but be a land of his kingdom. A land, a, a soil so, so amazing, a soil so rich, where a kingdom can, can't help but abide in and be blessed with the fruit of, of the milk and honey, just speaking of such abundance, such spiritual richness and wealth. But what we have to do is we have to get rid of our attitude as Moses and carry the heart of David. And I feel we're in a time now where we are running out of excuses to represent God's nature out in this world. Because God sent one man to free up his people from captivity. I believe his heart is still that today with God sending one being, the church, to free up those who are still in captivity today. How long can he call us and how many excuses can we make like Moses? Man, I wonder if Moses regretted even going towards the bush. There's a bush burning. What is that? And the Bible, God didn't say anything until he approached the bush. But then he could go no further. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. I got something for you to do, Moses. first response was, who am I? Have you ever felt like that? Who am I? <laughs> and then it's funny because he talks about, well, well, who should I say that sent him? He goes, tell him I am. I want to tell you today, just off of that alone, by the Spirit of God, you ain't got to worry about who am I. You just worry about I am is in you. Because the Bible says, I had to come down from heaven and release my people. And so he uses Moses as a vessel. But Moses still in rejection. What's the next excuse I can come up with? There's a couple of them. What if they don't believe me? 
Man, I, I felt that before. What if they don't believe my message? First of all, it ain't mine. Man, how selfish we get, don't we? <laughs> we forget who, who's even in charge. We forget. But he is so gracious and merciful. Anybody else horrible with words like Moses? I mean, that was his good excuse, wasn't it? My speech is garbage, basically. I don't even know. I can't talk. I can't even talk. The Bible says that the Lord burned with anger. That word anger speaks of a flaring in his nostrils. And I just think of the Lord like this. Oh, my gosh, Moses. You ever get angry your nostrils flare? That's the picture I got. I did. And he said, you ain't got to worry about it. I already got Aaron coming to you. And he's going to be happy. And you can tell him what to say. I mean, how many excuses can Moses have? And God's like, oh, my goodness, Moses. Holy cow. What's going on here? All I want you to do is tell him I am is coming. Go to Pharaoh, and then he has miracles in front of his hands. I mean, leprosy, back to normal, and a staff into a snake, and he picks it up, and he still questions God. God is giving his people every tool to go out there and be obedient. And we feel that this saturate going out is nothing more than a tool for God to use you to be stretched and to have an encounter with somebody else and tell them how great Jesus is and what it's going to cost to lay down your life. And everything in between. Man, God is not playing games. He's not a game player. That's what I'm talking about. 95% of people have never led anybody to the Lord. And, and I, can't even, I, can't even, I can't even question God. I, I read Haggai chapter 2, and he's like, you guys aren't building my temple. He says, consider this day before you did anything with disobedience. He withheld their crops. He withheld the dew. He withheld from them. Is he no different now? Is he not the same God? Because he knows as dad what is best for us. And he wants us to walk in obedience for him. I can never get God... I, can, I never get mad at God if I feel he's withholding from me. It's a revelation for me to say, Lord, check my spirit. What am I missing? What am I missing? But he says, from this day on, when you started laying one stone on the next, when you heard me and you walked in obedience, you are blessed from this day. And then we're happy again. The simplicity of obedience and faith that leads to a prosperity life by the Spirit of God. An abundant life. This is the importance of reconciliation, and this is the time that we're in. Because we were once there. And Moses, Moses lived there, and Moses saw the captivity. He saw the beatings. And he bails, and he knows what it's like. And still, in knowing what it's like, he says, why? And then in the end, he says this, please don't send me. Please don't send me. What do I mean by the heart of David? Let me tell you something. If 95% of people have never led anybody to the Lord, sharing our faith is our Goliath. 
Sharing our faith is our giant. And there they are in the battlefield waiting. There's Goliath mocking Israel. Israel, timid, scared, Saul the same. And Jesse sends his son David to go check on his brothers and see what's going on. God knew what was going on. God uses Jesse to send David. And the Bible says that David ran to the lions and said, what's going on over here? What's going on? Who is this Philistine coming against God's army, God's people? And he signs up. Send me in. Put me in, coach. Remember that Bruce Springsteen song? Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. All right. My son used to love that song, sorry. <laughs> but there he is. Who are you? You see, David knew who he was. Moses didn't in the beginning. He says, let me tell you something. I shepherd my father's sheep. I fought off lions and bears. And if my God, if my God can deliver me from the paw of a lion and the paw of a bear, my God will deliver me from that Philistine. No hesitation whatsoever. You see, he was delivered too. so that people could be delivered from. Church, it is no different with us. God is delivering us too so that we can help deliver people from. Sharing our faith is our Goliath. We have to own it. We have to face it. And we have to tell the enemy to keep his paws off. Because if my God is for me, who can be against me? I want to end with some scripture. In Isaiah 61. Wrong way, Caleb. Caleb. I want to tell you that you are anointed. If you are a believer, a committed follower, a laid down lifer of Jesus Christ, you are anointed. You know when they anointed sheep or they would pour oil over sheep? There it goes again. Come on, Caleb. They would pour oil. Shepherds would pour oil over the sheep's head. They would run down their wool because lice and other insects would get in their wool and make their way into the ears and kill them. Kill them. I don't know any other better painted picture of the enemy trying to get in the head of so many people and devour their mindset. But you are anointed. That is not your portion, and the enemy has no place in between your ears. You are empowered, protected, and blessed by the Most High God. Anointing is spirit-led instruction for you to do nothing more than his will. It's the same thing Jesus did. I only do what I see him doing. I only hear and I only say what I hear him saying by the Spirit of God. That is your portion. The 
spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release the darkness of the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor on the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide those who grieve Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness. And there is Jesus in the temple picking up the scroll, pulling out Isaiah 61 and Luke 4.18 and reads that same scripture and in verse 20, today it is being fulfilled. As he is, so are we in this world. And he says, don't worry, my friends, because the works that I am doing, you too will be doing, and even greater by the Spirit. church, we are called. Called. We are commanded to set the captives free by the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. You can stand, stand. Heavenly Father, it is truly a blessing, truly a blessing to stand with brothers and sisters, the like-minded, the like-hearted, the like-spirited, and say, Lord, we are trying to figure this out, but we know we have to stick to your word because, Lord, we are so easily swayed and the enemy wants to captivate our minds to lead us off track. But the fact is, your word says that thanks to you, we now have the ministry of reconciling enmity for friendship or friendship for enmity. That you want to use us to give people peace instead of hostility, to give people rest instead of frustration, to give people light instead of dark. And Lord, we thank you for every tool available that you're giving us, Lord, and we step in it and walk in it as a family. We give you everything, Jesus. Everything, Lord. Thank you for being the ultimate example on what it means to be attentive to the Father and be obedient and unconditional love. We worship you and we love you. In Jesus' name. And all the saints said, amen. amen. Church, hug somebody, love somebody. Randy's got something. Hey, just uh, real quick. I'll keep this super brief. One of the things that, we, that kept coming up um, during the kingdom quake was, if we're going to do something, you do it out of love. Because it's meaningless if you don't do it out of love. Don't do it out of duty. Do it out of love. And I just want to share a picture the Lord showed me as Caleb shared. You know, God loved man as a father from the beginning. And let me give you a picture. When he cast him out of the garden, has anybody in here ever had a rebe rebellious child? Okay, and, and if you're at that point that you have to push him out, it, your heart's broken. Do you know what it says in Genesis? Get a picture of this. They sinned. They were rebellious. He had to cast them out of the garden. But the Bible says that he clothed them. So picture a father having to cast his children out of the garden, brokenhearted, and as he's cast them out, he's clothing them to make sure that they're okay as they're going out of the garden. He had to do it because that was the law. That was the law of the kingdom. But his heart was broken as he clothed them to cast them out. Can you imagine? The point I'm trying to make to you is he's a loving father from the very, very beginning of eternity. 
as we do things, we need to do it in love. And, and here's the thing, you don't always feel love. Love is a verb. It's not what you feel, it's what you do. It's a verb. And if you don't feel the love, say, Lord, give me a heart of love for this zip code. Give me a heart of love for these people that I work with that, that seem unlovable. Give me your heart, Lord, towards my enemy. Give me your heart. And that's how we move in love, because if we don't do it in love, it doesn't matter. That's what the Bible says. So just ponder that this week and keep those people in your prayers. If you need prayer, we're up here. Praise God. Have an awesome week.